this looks like it's going to be very easy. Only one question. Uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> See what happens. Okay. Good evening, Ajahn. May I know what and how is the right approach to explain karma? Okay. Let's uh, let's uh, stop there. I can read the rest of this more. Usually, people take the opportunity to ask about three or four questions in one go. So we'll we we'll start with the first one, and <laughs> we'll come on to the other ones in a in a second. Uh, so uh, kamma, the uh, the way that it is traditionally explained in the kind of Buddhist societies is, uh, is that if you do one thing in one life, uh, good things happen to you in your next life. Uh, and uh, usually, peop often people have a very kind of materialistic uh, idea about this. Uh, so you do good things now. You give a, you know, give a, a donation to the sangha or something like that. Then in the next life, you really kind of you get that house you always wanted or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, and and that may be true. Uh, there is uh, no doubt some truth to that, and I will explain in a second why that is the case. Uh, but uh, the most important way of understanding kamma, the Buddha talks in a sutta about three kinds of kamma. One is called the dit eva dhamma kamma, which means the kamma that works in this very life. Dit eva dhamma uh, is actually dit eva dhamma means in the visible state. Uh, ditta is visible, dhamma is quality or state. So it refers to this very life. This life is the vi is the visible state. The future life is not visible. We can't see the future life. Yeah. So this is the visible state. So it refers to the uh, kamma that ripens in this very life. How does that work? And, and the best way to think about this, and this I think is a very powerful way because it really encourages you to live a good life, uh, and that is to feel the connection right now between your intentions uh, and how you feel about yourself. Uh. Yeah, so if you intend something kind, if you do something kind to somebody, you do an act of generosity, uh, you say something kind to somebody, you do some little help of service, uh, you massage the bikini, yeah, <laughs> over here, something like that, yeah. You do a little act of kindness, or you just think a kind thought uh, uh, about somebody. Uh, how do you feel? Uh? And you feel <laughs> straight away. You feel good about yourself, yeah. You know the feeling when you do an act of kindness. You always feel good about yourself afterwards. Uh. And it also has the opposite effect. If you do something which is not so kind, uh, you start to feel a bit. You feel a bit bad about yourself. You kind of dark, your mind becomes a bit darker. You lose some of the brightness inside, uh, and you feel a bit dull and depressed and sad if you do something bad towards somebody. So please notice that. Notice the connection between your intention of kindness uh, or your intention of unkindness uh, and how you feel. And that is really the kamma in this very life. Uh. Yeah, and if you see that, and you can actually notice that directly, it gives you a tremendous encouragement to act well, because you, you know that being kind actually makes you feel good about yourself. Uh, so b suddenly you understand that kindness is not so much about others, uh, well it is about others as well, but it's about yourself. Yeah, Everyone wins, it's a win classical win-win situation. Other people benefit, you benefit. Uh. And this, I think, is one of the nice ways of thinking about the spiritual life. The spiritual life, or a spiritual act, a spiritual, uh, compared to a worldly action, uh, a spiritual action is one that benefits both you and the other person. Uh. When you are generous, it obviously benefits the other person, it also benefits you. Uh. When you say something kind, it benefits the other person, it also benefits you. Uh. When you think something kind, well, it, that too benefits other people because usually it means you become more at peace, more relaxed, and you become more pleasant when you think kind thoughts. So even that benefits others, uh, especially in the long run, it also benefits you. Huh? This is a very easy way of thinking about it. So anything that benefits both uh, is a good thing to do. Huh? And if you do this, Regularly, continuously, yeah. If you all, if you try, if you do many, many good acts with good intentions, gradually, what's happening inside of you, your mind gets lifted up. Your mind gets brighter, lighter. Gradually, going on this inclination upwards, feeling better and better. You're accumulating many moments where you are feeling good about yourself. You're lifting yourself up. At the same time as you are lifting yourself up in this way, uh, uh, metaphorically. Um, 
you're also cutting those things that hold you down. What holds you down is the bad actions. You don't do those bad actions anymore. Eh? So the things that hold you down and slow you down from taking off, in a sense, from uh, becoming like a helium balloon, soaring up, uh, the things that stop you from that, you cut those fetters, those anchors, those uh, ropes tied to the ground, you cut those off, so you allow yourself to soar up. Uh, and this is how Kama works. You avoid doing the bad things, you do the good things, uh, and your mind feels brighter, lighter, and happier as a consequence. Uh, it takes, often takes time. You have to do it again and again and again, but over, sometimes you can feel it immediately. Sometimes you can feel the cumulative effect over long periods of time. Yeah? You do it months after months, and gradually you feel this uh, elevation, feeling better about yourself. Uh, and it's wonderful when you start to see that. It's very powerful. And uh, you really feel that the spiritual life has meaning. Yeah? Even if you don't do any meditation, uh, even if you just live with kindness, uh, that is often enough to give spiritual my life real meaning. Uh, and then, whoa, you soar up. Uh, and you are creating here an inner life, an inner life for yourself that is pleasant, that is beautiful. Uh, and this is the first way of creating a refuge for yourself within. Uh, and uh, the world outside matters less for you as a consequence. Uh, and you can imagine if you keep on doing this, uh, and when the moment comes uh, when you eventually will die, uh, yeah, you have already built up so much uh, positive energy in yourself that when you die, your mind is at a different level, if you like. I call it level because it's a different energy inside, a different level. And when you came into this world, or when you were young or whatever, uh, you feel brighter. Uh, and because you are at a different level when you die, that is the level where you start out in your new life. Uh, and that level is going to be higher than it was before. That means it's a better rebirth. Yeah? So this is how karma works. This is why you have a better rebirth, because you already have a brighter mind. It continues at that level. And if that le rebirth is at a higher level, well, that then of course many of the things, you know, if you are the materialistic kind, but after a while you kind of you lose interest in the materialistic things. Yeah? If you're on this path after a while, okay, initially it's nice to have a pleasant house, a pleasant home, but after a while you don't become so concerned about those things anymore. You realize the qualities, the internal qualities are far more important. Uh, but if you still have an interest in that because you haven't been reborn in a kind of more brighter realm, still the, even the material things tend to be better. Yeah? Uh, so this is how the material things kind of tie in with the idea of Kama in, that, uh, uh, in the new existence. Uh, so uh, that is really how it works, uh, and this is how I tend to look at it, because it's a very practical way of dealing with, uh, dealing with Kama. Now, one of the things that people often get wrong with Kama is that they think that everything in life is Kama. So as a monastic, very often what happens you know, uh, to me is that people come to me and they ask, oh, you know, I have any suffering in life. Uh, what did I do in the past to deserve this? Uh, and this is because we tend to explain everything that happens to us as being some kind of kamma we did in the past. Uh, but actually, it is not really like that. Uh, in several places in the suttas, the Buddha says that there are many reasons for feeling the way we do. Kamma is only one. Uh, the Buddha says, uh, gives another example, so he gives illness. Yeah, in the old days, uh, illness was explained as an imbalance of the bodily, various bodily things like the f uh, phlegm and... Uh, wind and phlegm and various kind of uh, parts of the body uh, that were kind of in imbalance, then you had illnesses. This was another reason why you feel bad. So if you, have, if you get cancer, uh, it may have nothing to do with karma. It may just be imbalance of the bodily humors. That's kind of w the expression they use sometimes. Uh, yeah, it's just nature. This is what happens when you have a human body. You get ill sometimes. It's got nothing to do with karma. You get assaulted in the street. Uh, yeah, this is also specifically said to be a separate explanation for why we feel bad. You get assaulted. Why? Because you went down the wrong street at the wrong time. Yeah, sometimes you have to be careful where you go. And if you are careless, of course, then you are encouraging bad things to happen. That's another one of the reasons, carelessness. So don't, don't never say, I'm going to test out my karma, see how good it is. Because then you're being careless. And of course, the consequence of that is Bad things happen to you. Nothing to do with karma. It's just because you're being silly. That's why it is happening here. Yeah. 
So a lot of things in life have to do with the fact that you have been reborn in this human existence with a human body. When you have been reborn as a human with a human body, certain things tend to happen with us. Uh, sometimes you get married, sometimes you get divorced. Uh, sometimes you are happy, sometimes you're, you are, you're sad, sometimes you break a leg, sometimes you lose your job, uh, sometimes you win the lottery. Uh, yeah, all of these things are uncertain and they happen to all of us. Uh, sometimes they may have a connection with karma, but very often they don't. Uh, and even death, you know, you, you may die young uh, and uh, you may die young for all kinds of reasons. Kama is only one of them. The suttas don't say that you die young just because of kama. What the suttas say is that if you do bad kama, then you might die young. If you have killed people in the past life and you happen to be reborn as a human being, then that may cause you to die young. But it doesn't say that all every time you die young, it is because you killed somebody in the past life or because you made bad kama. Those are two very different things. So this is uh, this is important to uh, to realize, and then we, uh, we 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 understand karma in a more. The reason why people often ask these questions is that they want they want an answer, and they want an answer because so they can be able to more control the world. If the answer is that I made karma in the past life, and the consequences of that is that now I just make good karma, and then in the future life it, these things won't happen to me. Huh? Actually, they will still happen to you. Huh? That's the problem. Huh? Uh, even if you make good karma, you may have less troubles, less problems, you will still have problems, however. Uh, so karma is not the uh, f full answer to these things. Uh. There are many more things to be said about karma. There's lots of myths and falsehoods about karma. One of those myths that often you hear in Buddhist circles is that to be reborn as a woman is a result of bad karma. But there is no basis for that in the suttas. It's a there's absolutely no basis at all. Uh, you are the kamma. Is, you know, if you are a human being, that is one type of kamma. Animal, okay, animal is bad kamma, but not being reborn as a woman or man. It's roughly the same. Yeah. What, okay. Sometimes, as a woman, it might be a little bit more difficult. There still is a little bit of inequality in most societies, but the difference is quite small. Whereas the difference between an animal and a human is it really, really serious and really big. So the idea that uh, it's bad karma to be reborn as a human is one of those myths and legends that we need to get past. Uh, yeah, it is just nonsense. It's got no di no, nothing to do with reality and you have the same spiritual potential whether you are a man or a woman doesn't make any difference. Uh, okay. There's just a few things about karma, and uh, a few years ago with um, Ajahn Sujato and myself we did a workshop on karma and rebirth that is still available on the internet if you're interested. Uh, and uh, the first workshop we did, what uh, this was Ajahn Sujato's idea, we did myth busting. Yeah, yeah we <laughs> tried to bust all the myths about karma. Well, there's so many, it's very hard to b bust them all, but uh, we had a long list of myths. And so if you're interested in more details about karma and rebirth according to early Buddhism, everything we do is according to early Buddhism, uh, you can have a look, check it out on the internet and listen to that workshop that we did. Uh, that was many years ago, oh, I don't know how many years ago, four or five years ago, something like that. Uh. Okay, so that is the first question. Also, it is said that Buddha Gautama is the fifth Buddha. Does that mean that he is the fifth Buddha in our current universe, world cycle? Uh, yes, that is basically what it means. Uh, how, you know, is this how, how literally should we understand this? Is it really true or not? And uh, the Buddha, t the in one of the suttas, it talks about the Buddha Kasapa and Buddha Gautama is supposed to even to have met the previous Buddha Kasapa. And that is actually very interesting, that meeting, because during that meeting, the the future Buddha, future Buddha Gautama, the way he talks about Buddha Kasapa, he kind of almost, uh, he almost abuses him. Yeah, it's really kind of, um, it's like you, know, you shaven-headed ascetics. I don't have anything to do with them. Doesn't abuse him in his presence, but in his absence, uh, he talks really badly about the Buddha Kasapa. And this is one of those things that makes you wonder about the Bodhisattva ideal, or one of the things that makes you quite clear that the Bodhisattva idea is. Uh, doesn't really have much merit because according to the Bodhisattva idea you're supposed to practice for four eons. You're supposed to get closer and closer to becoming a Buddha and every Buddha on the way you're supposed to become the disciple. Yeah? 
But here he abuses this Buddha. He has no idea about Buddhism. He doesn't understand anything. He's completely out of it. It doesn't look like he's practicing the path to become a Buddha at all. It looks like he is, uh, you know, deluded, just like uh, uh, most people. That's the feeling you get. So the it's one of those things that makes it fairly clear that the Bodhisattva idea is a later um, idea that arose in Buddhism after the Buddha's time. Uh, and does that also mean that the previous Buddhas were possibly born on another planet uh, as the Earth's age is too young uh, for a few eons to take place? Uh, um, not really, uh, because um, uh, the, the, the um, suttas talk about world systems. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting about the suttas. We had one of the other people he just talked about about cosmology uh, just before Buddhist cosmology. And one of the nice the things that the Buddha says in the suttas, he says that uh, uh, there is not we have you know the one world system is the kind of the earth, the moon, the sun, and then all the beings that exist in connection with that. Uh, and then the Buddha says, well, then th but then there's other earths and suns and moons, yeah, with beings around them. And each one of these is called the world system. And if you look at that, it sounds exactly like a solar system. That's what it sounds like, yeah. It's very hard to avoid that conclusion almost. Uh, so it seems that the Buddha had an idea of solar systems. Uh, exactly how he got that knowledge, I don't really know. I can speculate, but I don't actually know. Uh, and I, I wrote a little paper about this, and actually I, I gave a talk about it, and uh, I wrote a paper about it later on. Uh, and uh, anyway, it's in a, uh, there's a booklet that we have, it's also available on the internet. But, um, uh, and each one of these world systems uh, can have a Buddha at the same time. There can only be one Buddha, according to the Buddhist ideas, in one world system at the same time. So on earth you can only have one Buddha, but an other world system can have a Buddha. So there may be Buddhas out there now. Yeah. So if you want to meet the Buddha, all you have to do is get into deep samadhi, travel around the various world systems, uh, and see if you can find the Buddhas. Yeah. It's kind of neat. So may maybe there are, there probably are Buddhas out there right now, but they're just not in this world system, a different world system. Actually, probably really hard to find. You probably have to survey billions of world systems. Uh, so it takes a long time to survey billions of world systems. Uh. But uh, so each world system has its own Buddha. So when they talk about five Buddhas, it's about this world system, uh, this earth, or this world system that we're talking about. Uh, um, so the question, how is that possible? And the way it is possible is that uh, one of the things here is that the lifespans during previous Buddhas, the lifespans of uh, the human realm fluctuates. Yeah? The human realm is not static, it is a fluctuating realm. Sometimes the lifespan can be 10,000 years. Uh. Now if you have a lifespan of 10,000 years, uh, it's not going to be with this body here, because this body cannot make it for 10,000 years. Uh, after 100 years, this body is already exhausted. You want to die, you had enough. Uh, even even if, some, if someone wants to keep you alive, you beg them, please kill me, I've had enough. Uh, this is why we have euthanasia, we have assisted suicide, yeah? because oh, this body, jeepers, now it's falling apart in a bad way. Uh. So, uh, you can imagine what is happening is that the human realm would be slightly different. It would be more like a deva realm perhaps, maybe halfway between devas and humans. So it wouldn't really be visible as an ordinary human realm perhaps. I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating now, I have to admit this is pure speculation, but I'm just saying if you are living for 10,000 years, it can't be an ordinary body like this, it's got to be something else. And because we know the realms fluctuate, it is quite likely that the human realm sometimes is more like a deva realm, sometimes more like the animal realm. Yeah, sometimes humans become really brutish, we already now we look at some humans, we call them animals because they are behaving so badly here. Yeah. Yeah, so the human realms fluctuate uh, between the animal or the ghost realm and the higher realms. Uh. And this is how it is possible that even if the earth wasn't here, this solar system might have existed in a, in a different form, so to speak, perhaps. Uh. This becomes very theoretical because it's very hard to really know about these things, but uh, uh, if, we, you know, if you have a, an idea of a Deva Loka, uh, you can imagine how these things can, be, can perhaps be different. Uh, and that's how I would perhaps look at this, uh, even though I have to admit it's very speculative what I'm, what I'm saying now. Something like that. Uh, 
but not on another planet because then it's a different um, uh, different uh, solar system. Uh. And the next Buddha might not be born on Earth. Well, he he probably he should be born within the same kind of a uh, framework. Otherwise, it is it doesn't belong to this uh, this. Uh, a, a world system, uh, yeah, this loka datu, as it's called in Pali. Uh, uh, so, um, but uh, probably it would be would be within this world system. Uh, so, um, yeah. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, the Buddha said that out there there were all the solar systems. Uh, yeah, they had moons, the sun, the planet, and they had human beings living there, or they had beings living there, aliens. Yeah, so the Buddha knew about aliens already. Uh, <laughs> that's basically what it is, yeah? Beings living in other solar systems, that's exactly what we call aliens. So the Buddha already talked about aliens two and a half thousand years ago. It's kind of cool, isn't it? And now we are looking out into the universe, we're trying to see if we can see beings on other planets, the aliens, and then, then we will find out whether the Buddha was right or not. If there are beings there, and it seems more and more likely, the more we look out into the solar systems and the rest of the universe, we seem to be getting closer to that feeling that there are other beings out there. We're starting to see more and more planets. We're seeing planets in the habitable zone, which is a certain band within the sun. Actually, we don't really know these things, we're just guessing, I think. But all the things seem to be coming together. So one day, you know, we are two and a half thousand years after the Buddha. The Buddha was there already. Uh, he already perhaps knew about these things. Uh, it's kind of uh, astonishing. Uh. How did he know about these things? Uh, that's for another time. Uh. <laughs> okay, so is there anything else we should uh, talk about in this connection or any other connection uh, that you would like to bring up uh, at this point? Uh? Yes, please. Uh. I suppose that when you mentioned that uh, the uh, uh, Gautama Buddha uh, belittling uh, previous uh, Kasapuva Buddha, it was from Katikara Sutta. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, uh, please forgive me if I get some of the facts wrong. Um, I think it was mentioned in the Sutta that Kasapa stay in Benares. Uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. So yeah. I think if the previous yeah. Buddha live in the uh, ages long past ago yeah. how does how does one <laughs> say that it, yeah. Kasa Benares existed then yeah and also the the yeah. other questions that I have is that um, since you the, the the cosmology according to Buddhism mm. right uh, the human lifespan can spend up to ten thousand mm. uh, years yeah how, how does it reconcile with theory of evolution why don't we find mm. any fossil records of uh, such human beings at all. Mm. Uh, okay. You. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. So yeah, I, I agree with you. This idea that you know the previous Buddha was living in Benares, he was living in Jambudipa. Jambudipa was the ancient Indian word for India. So everything is always the Buddha, according to this, always gets reborn in India. That's an unfair. Yeah, we would like to have in Malaysia or Australia as well. You know, why always India? And, and I think that has to do with, it just has to do with the Indian outlook. They consider themselves the civilized land, that was the you know, only way. It is all, because remember this is more, it is very mythological, yeah, and it, we have to, I think we have to accept that even the Gatikara Sutta, when they talk about this, they talk about these things in a way that the local population can understand, yeah? So they talk about Benares, they talk about India. I don't think we should take these things too literally. It is the roughly equivalent of India. It could be that what they are saying is that uh, wherever the Buddha is reborn, that is called Jampudipa. Yeah, so we just define Jampudipa as the country where the Buddha is reborn, and then we call that Jampudipa and then we call the city Benares, and then you kind of solve the problem in that way. <laughs> but it's so, so I don't think we should take these things too literally. I think we should you know, give it a lot of leeway. There's a lot of legend, uh, legendary and mythological ideas in this. Uh, so so it, it is indeed, it is strange, and it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that, that's, so I fully agree with you. Huh? Uh, on the idea of the fossil record and uh, evolution, the point is that, you know, you might as well ask, what about the devas? Where is the fossil record of the devas? Uh, there is no fossil record, so devas can't exist. But of course the point is that the devas don't exist in, with, in ordinary, hum with human material bodies. They exist in a different kind of realm or a different reality. So you cannot expect to find any, any fossil record of the devas, because 
that's just not how they are. Yeah, they are reborn in a, that's, that's what we mean by a higher realm. It's a mental realm. It's not the realm that leaves a fossil record. Uh, and the same thing, if human beings live for 10,000 years and they have a different kind of body, uh, they wouldn't leave a fossil record in an ordinary way. Uh, they would be more like the devas. Uh, yeah, they would be more mind-made uh, and wouldn't have a physical body in this sense. Yeah? It's like when you have an out-of-body experience, uh, you have a body. Yeah, but it's not a body in the phys in this strong. Ma it's, a, it's a fine material body. Huh? So if you leave your body now, I wouldn't be able to see you because it, it would be fine material body, and that body also does not leave uh, a, a fossil record. And so you can actually, you know, dig. Uh, it is not. It is not part of the ordinary evolution, huh? and that's why you wouldn't be able to see it. Uh. So they are human beings, but they are human beings not quite in the way we are human beings. Uh. Yeah, they're kind of a different type of human beings, if you like. Uh, they're still called human beings because the kamma that takes you there is roughly the same as the kamma that takes us into this state, uh, but they, they are still different in many ways. Uh. Does that answer your question? Huh? <laughs> okay, think about it. Yeah, and I mean, we are remember we are speculating now. These things are not actually written down in the suttas anywhere. You know, the suttas don't say anything about DNA and evolution and this kind of things. Uh, so we are, it is there is a degree of speculation in this, uh, but the universe is quite mysterious in many ways, uh, and there's a lot of things, a lot of possibilities out there. Uh, so. Uh, Come up with your own theory. Yeah, I, I'm sure there are some I so a book to be written about this topic. Yeah, where someone who is a bit creative and can come up with some interesting ideas. Uh, yeah, the Buddha's point is never to create a philosophy or even a natural philosophy of how the world works. That is not the point of the Buddha, and that's why information in the suttas is very limited on these things. Uh, the information you find in the suttas is always in connection with Dhamma points. Uh, so when the Buddha talks about the universe, he talks about that in connection with other points of Dhamma that really are significant. Uh, so he talks about impermanence, uh, and then he brings in the idea of the universe to show impermanence, not because he wants to talk about the universe. Uh, so it is like by the by, it's, a, it's an added thing which is not central to the argument, uh, and that's why you don't have a complete theory of these things in the suttas, that's why we are grappling in the dark when we try to understand what is going on. Uh. The Buddha in a sense is saying, forget about these things, it doesn't matter. Uh, stick to the kind of more basic things, okay, are you suffering now? Will this lead away from suffering? Yeah, okay, well then do that, because you know it's going to lead you in the right way. T don't try to speculate too much. Uh, and probably because there's no end to that speculation. Once you start philosophizing, whether it's natural philosophy, in other words science, or it is more uh, speculative philosophy, uh, there is no end to it. Uh, and they probably never find all the answers in it anyway. Uh, so you just end up spending the rest of your life thinking about these things. Uh, and then when you get reborn, because that's your habit, you continue doing it also in your next life. You never get out of samsara. You are stuck. Uh, so this is part of the problem, and I think the Buddha probably foresaw that. Uh, and he says in some of the suttas, he has the simile of the uh, handful of leaves. Yeah, he says he, he picks up a handful of leaves from the from the uh, from the ground, and he says, "What is more, all of these these leaves in my hand are all the leaves overhead in the in the jata grove in the trees." Uh, and the monks say, "Oh, the ones in your hand is less." Yeah, surprise, surprise. <laughs> And then he says, well, in the same way, what I know and what I have declared, what I know is like the, all the things overhead, what I have declared is what is in my hand. Why? Because this is what is useful. So what is all that other stuff? Well, probably it is his understanding maybe of the universe, how things work, how they don't work, but things that actually are irrelevant to the Dhamma, to liberation. And the reason why he doesn't say it, well, uh, because it's specifically because it is irrelevant. It is about speculation, it is about thinking, it is about uh, all these other things that are endless. Uh, and once you get into that area, once you get trapped with that, uh, it's hard to get out again. Huh? Something like that, yeah? So, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Nothing else? Okay. Great. We so, uh, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> so you yeah. mentioned that karma affects the mind. How about uh, for someone who has amnesia, 
who don't remember that they've done such and such good or bad deeds. So how does karma affect their mind? Okay. Uh, usually the way it affects their mind is that uh, when in the process of death, uh, when, the, when you, the mind is leaving the body, uh, you regain all your memories again. Uh, yeah. So at that moment, bang, it comes back to you. Uh. So if you've done lots of evil, you cannot escape just by amnesia. Yeah? Just because you get Alzheimer's, you don't get away from it. Uh. And, uh, and, and there is some interesting I research on this area, which is very exciting. I, I don't know if you have, 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 have you read the book? There's a book called um, Irreducible Mind. Have you read that book? Yeah. It's a very interesting book about all the evidence that there is for the mind not being fully tied to the body, the mind actually being able to separate from the body. And uh, one of the pieces of evidence there by, by these researchers, these are some of the best research in this phenomena around. Uh, it's a really nice book. And, um, one of the evidence, pieces of evidence is uh, uh, from hospitals around the world uh, and where they say that it's apparently it's quite common knowledge about doctors. Uh, is there any doctors here? Huh? Anyone here? Is anyone here a medical doctor? Huh? No? Okay. So anyway, so uh, quite common knowledge, especially among those who specialize in, uh, in, uh, in Alzheimer and people at the end of their life, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, apparently, people quite commonly, maybe 1% of the population or whatever, they become lucid at the very end of their life. Even though they had Alzheimer's for 10 years, 15 years, haven't, don't recognize anybody, have no idea what's going on, towards the very end it's like, oh, hello son, hello daughter, how are you? Uh, you know, they speak to them with a name, with complete lucidity, and then bang, they're gone. And this is very interesting because from an ordinary medical point of view, it's inexplicable. If the brain is completely damaged, you cannot explain how this happens. Uh, but from a Buddhist point of view, it kind of makes sense because at the very end, the, you are separating. That body is no longer limiting the mind in the way it used to. You're starting to separate, starting to move into a new reality. Your mind regains its former ability to remember again. Uh, and part of that memory will be access to all the karma of the past. Yeah? bang, it hits you. So if you did a lot of good things, it will come back to you again at that particular point. Uh, so that I think is part of the answer. Uh. But I think also another part of the answer is that even if you do have amnesia or Alzheimer or whatever, I think the point is that the actions you did, even if you can't remember them, they will still affect you in a sense. Yeah? It just as now, if you have done a lot of good things in the past, uh, even if you don't specifically think about them, you will generally be a more happy person because you did those acts. Uh. They will still affect you mentally, even if you don't literally remember them. Uh. So there's, I think there's me uh, several mechanisms there which actually, actually work in that way. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing is that, um, back Back to what the question was saying, uh, if the there were previous Buddhas uh, before this universe cycle, yeah. then it should not be on this earth because uh, this earth only created on this universe cycle and there's no sure. absolute okay. space. Sure, if it was previous universe cycles, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's no absolute uh, yeah. space coordinate for yeah. shots the same planet to ar arise as Absolutely, space. yeah. Yeah, that, that is a, that's a good point. So it's the question, I suppose, is whether it was within this particular eon. If it was yeah. within this eon, then it is possible that there may be a connection. But if it was previous eons, uh, then uh, yeah, then it's a different situation altogether. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> mentioned about this world cycle yeah. and uh, there's only likely to be one Buddha. Not yeah. necessary because before this um, this civilization we had Atlantis Lemurian times. Yeah, maybe. About 15, 20,000 years ago there could be yeah. Buddhas yeah. but on earth. Maybe. Right now. Maybe, yeah. Because there have been records yeah. of uh, such civilizations. Yeah. Right? Sure, okay. I'm open for I'm open for many possibilities so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to have be quite open-minded with uh, some of Buddhist teachings because they are a different way of looking at the world, you know? You can't be too, too kind of uh, closed down in your ideas and things, uh, so that's good. Okay, great. So, uh, is that it? Nobody, nobody wants to say anything? Everyone has said enough, yeah? <laughs> I have certainly said enough. So, um, okay, I think the, I was asked by Bobby whether we could take a group picture. 
before we go? Is everyone happy to take a group picture? Uh, yeah? So let's do that now. And then we. What time do we start tomorrow again, uh, Bobby? Uh, I didn't.